Uh, in the interest of time, I'll invite our next speaker to the podium, uh, Linda Thurston, who's an intensive care registrar at the University Hospital Geelong. And Linda's going to talk to us about uh, defining patient-centred recovery after critical illness, a qualitative study. Thanks very much, Linda. Thank you. So yes, I'm a senior registrar at Geelong Hospital where I've been running this study. Um, I have to acknowledge my fellow researchers, the majority of which are also ANZICs um, affiliated. So Geelong Hospital is a regional tertiary level hospital. It covers a very large area of southwestern Victoria. Our ICU admits uh, medical and surgical patients. It has a steady stream of cardiothoracics and we also have ECMO capability. We don't have neurosurgical, trauma, burns or transplant patients. So this study was designed to be a qualitative exploratory study using semi-structured interviews and open questions in order to explore our aim. Now at the heart of the study was a desire to use a patient-centered approach to look at what is important to our patients in their recovery from critical illness. We targeted adult patients who'd been ventilated for at least 24 hours, six months after discharge from our intensive care unit. And our sample size was to be determined by thematic saturation, which is a process where as you go through and analyse each interview for themes, you eventually reach a point of no further return, where nothing new comes up. Now I did all of the patient contact um, and data collection for the study. The consent process was in two stages, which we negotiated with our ethics committee. So I made an initial phone call purely to seek permission to send them information and then followed that up with another call after giving them time to consider it. And if they were agree agreeable, we went on to arrange the interview. Because of that process, it was easiest to do all of um, the approach at a single time frame for everyone that was eligible at that time point. And after the initial um, run of interviews, we managed to get 18. Six months later, after the process of going through and analysing all of that, we realised we didn't actually have saturation. So uh, we had to go back and do another run of interviews. So in total, for those two um, time points, we had 89 potentially eligible patients. I managed to contact 48 of them, and of those, 35 agreed to take part, and we interviewed them. So those uh, interviews were transcribed and uploaded to NVivo, which is a software used for analysing qualitative data. We had an initial um, analysis by two of our investigators, and then myself and another investigator went through and, and, and looked through all of that again to ensure that we had agreement regarding our four major overarching themes, the recovery trajectories that we allocated to each case, and that we had saturation. Most of our patients were male with a median age of 64, Apache 3 of 67. Our ICU and hospital length of stays were five and 17 days respectively. About half of our patients were medical and the remainder fairly evenly split between cardiothoracics and general surgery with a good mixture of elective and emergency cases. 60% of our patients discharged directly to home. About half of those were actually with the support of hospital in the home and the remainder went to other hospitals or to rehab facilities. The actual interview times varied quite significantly in length, but our median time frame was 18 minutes. So after going through and analysing all of this data, we agreed on four major overarching themes. I don't have time to go through all of them in a lot of detail, but I will briefly give you an overview of them. So it's no surprise that when you ask someone to describe their recovery, that they're going to talk about their physical challenges, their involvement in rehabilitation, having to adapt to their new bodies and the um, regaining of function. Common themes in this area were being more emotionally labile, being afraid of recurrence of disease, afraid of death, being grateful for being alive. Several described quite terrifying hallucinations and periods of delirium, which some were still really struggling to come to terms with. And this theme of understanding their illness narrative came across as quite important. And for some of our patients, it was actually at an obsessive level. People really appreciate good experiences, um, but poor experiences, episodes of bad communication, 
if they ever felt that their dignity or confidentiality had been breached, were very negative memories and they held onto, it, onto them quite strongly. <clears throat> Support came from family, friends, workplaces and the health services and it was very much appreciated and integral to most of our patients' recovery. It was quite clear to us that those who had no family, little community support and very poor relationships with their services were doing worse. And that's actually one of the reasons we went on to compare uh, the themes across these three recovery trajectories. So the group that um, had recovered well were back doing most of their activities, including their hobbies and socialising. They'd very strongly engaged in their rehabilitation and ad adapted to their new bodies. They were very positive, they spoke a lot of gratitude and they appeared to be quite health literate. They'd understood what had happened to them, managed to accept it and move on. The, most of our patients were in this middle ground of recovering where they felt that they'd come a very long way but they still had some way to go. They'd gone back to most essential activities, some of them were back at work which they'd managed to negotiate graded returns to. They spoke of lacking confidence and holding themselves back from doing certain things. Many were having cognitive difficulties and a lot of this uh, group had an ongoing significant burden of appointments and care and we started hearing frustrations relating to disjointed care and poor communication between their service providers. A lot of these patients wanted to debrief and that actually added a significant amount of time on the phone with them at certain um, times. The group that had done badly had significant ongoing physical challenges such as pain, weakness and fatigue. They were very fearful of a recurrence of disease and death. There was a lot of fixation on negative cognitive events that had happened to them while they were in hospital. They spoke of symptoms of anxiety and depression and they really appeared to have a much poorer understanding of what had happened to them. They had more complaints about their care and not surprisingly were therefore unhappy and untrusting of health services. And they, as said earlier, had little to no family support. We went on to compare some of the characteristics between these three groups and now our numbers are too small to make any statistical conclusions from this. But the trends highlighted uh, hypothesis generating at least. So less surprising things, the poor recovery group had more females and more medical patients in it. And they were more likely to reach criteria for life limiting illness. But more surprising were the trends relating to length of, length of stay both in ICU and hospital. Um, and the intubation hours were significantly higher in the recovered group, so the group that had done well. And that may obviously leads to a few thoughts about whether or not we treat those patients differently. Do we hold them closer to our heart and give them more support afterwards? Or do they just have more time to process what has happened to them before they go? Or is it that we transfer out more patients to smaller regional hospitals and they do worse? So areas that we felt were important to recovery after this study were the person's attitude and commitment to their own rehabilitation, person-centred care, or what we heard more of was actually the lack of it, their understanding of their illness and journey, having smooth transitions between ICU, ward rehab and home, ongoing access to and support from the health services and supportive family, friends and workplaces. We felt that our open interview format was a strength of our study as well as the numbers of number of interviews that we managed to conduct, which for a qualitative study is actually quite, uh, 35 is a good number. And in regard to our analysis and agreement amongst multiple investigators um, about our results. Our study is obviously at risk of selection bias. Are we missing something important from the ones that we couldn't get hold of or who declined to take part? And we also changed the original plan from a longitudinal design with the original plan to interview at 0, 6 and 12 months. And that was because of the enormous time commitment involved in recruiting, interviewing and analysing this data. And we're obviously also at risk of um, generalisability to other ICUs and populations. And I'd just la lastly like to acknowledge my fellow investigators, some of the nurses at our unit who gave me a lot of help in the initial phases of patient contact and the participants and their families. Are there any questions?
Thank you very much, Linda. Thanks for a fantastic presentation. Uh, it's a fascinating methodology, the interviews with uh, the individual patients. In our intensive cares, a lot of the time our interactions are with very unconscious patients and very awake relatives. I, I note you've excluded relative input on this study. Do you think it would be um, helpful or, or give different messages if, in fact, the interviews were not just with patients but with their families themselves? We actually offered them to involve their families and to bring support people. So we actually, uh, probably about four of the interviews were with their, usually their spouse, <coughs> wife or partner. So we didn't actually exclude that input. It just didn't happen as much as we would have liked. So when we asked about arranging the interview, they were offered face-to-face -to, -face to bring people with them if they wanted to. And over the phone, we did a few um, on speaker. Um, thank you, great presentation and a lot of work. Um, what we obviously struggle to measure outcomes in our patient populations based on what you've looked at and what you've heard. How should we be measuring outcomes? It's a very good question. And that was one of the um, ideas that went into designing the study. Um, I think it's a very difficult area, uh, and even having done all of this work, I don't think I have any definite answers for you in regard to what we should be looking at. Um, there are a few other studies that have looked into specific outcome scores a little bit more closely and, sh and shown that they don't um, cover all of the areas that are important. Uh, I do think that this will add to a bit of that body of research in regard to what we should be thinking about. Um, because the, the obvious things like physical rehabilitation and where they are from a mental point of view are uh, there, but the, we were a bit surprised how much the care experience came through in these interviews. Um, and I think in some ways satisfaction of their journey and care could be something that we could be looking into a bit more as well. That Difficult was a question to answer, yeah. well. <laughs> So I just want to say great study. Qualitative research is extremely time consuming and an enormous amount of work and you did it very well. Thank it's you. a very nice study. Um, one theme that's come up a lot at this meeting is that we really don't know um, whether post ICU clinics are efficacious in improving outcomes and we haven't really figured out how to target certain patients for these additional resources after discharge. So do you think with your separation of the three groups that your results may help us target which patients might benefit the most from the support of a post-ICU clinic? Um, in some ways, yes. Again, that's a, a, it's tricky because some people really want that and they want to debrief and they're very clear about that. Um, and some people really just don't want to be involved with anything ever again, any, any thought of coming back to ICU or see, talking to anyone about it. Um, they're not too keen. I think we lost a lot of those with the ones that declined to take part, to be honest. Um, there was definitely a stronger theme in some of the middle ground patients and the ones that had done badly that they really wanted to debrief. They wanted to talk to people. Um, how you work out who to target from that point of view without actually contacting them and say, do you want this, um, is difficult. And it's potentially something we could look at adding in at, at discharge time, even um, in a follow-up call a few months later once they've come to terms with where they're at. Yeah, but I do think it is, I, I certainly felt while I was talking to some of these people that it would be really helpful for some of them. <coughs> I'll just have a quick one as well. <coughs> Pardon me. In your, the better outcomes, were 90% of the better outcomes male? Is that, is, is that what that slide showed? Yes. Uh, is well. it possible that um, men just don't tell you the truth? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I found some of them were a bit more blasé about it, so, but yeah. Thanks very anyway. much, Linda. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.